Need Bitcoin support? The pros at Coinbeast Connect are here to help. Learn about self-custody, privacy, mining, lightning payments, and much more. Simply go to coinbeast.com backslash connect and schedule a one-on-one video call with a Bitcoin pro. Take your knowledge to the next level by connecting with a pro on coinbeast.com today. Please check out episode 41 with Adam O, aka Denver Bitcoin on Twitter, episode 46 with Hoddle Tarantula, or episode 49 with Adam Meister. All our pros you can connect with at coinbeast.com connect today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Chris Alamo, and I am an amateur investor. This podcast is my open source journal of everything I learn about investing and wealth management. I'm here to explore the key concepts, market dynamics, and investing strategies that will assist you on the path towards financial independence and financial literacy. My mission is to build us from amateurs to experts. All suggestions are my own, and I recommend that you should do your own research before taking any investment advice. See you in this week's episode. I hope you enjoy How's it going, everyone? This is episode 53 of the Amateur Investors Podcast. On this episode, I'm going to be interviewing Mario Mario Gibney, the Director of Community at uh, Lennon.io and co-host of the Unhashed Podcast. Mario, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so uh, I guess I'm going to change up the order a little bit of the questions here, but I guess, do you want to talk a little bit about what Lennon.io does as a company? Sure. Uh, yeah, we can dive right into that if you like. Um, so Leden is, uh, we offer basic uh, financial uh, services uh, for your uh, Bitcoin and USDC. Uh, I've been with the company about six months now, and um, our our main products are kind of first stuff you interact with our interest accounts. So if you, uh, if you uh, uh, deposit a BTC or a USDC on our platform, we can offer a, um, an interest rate based on that. Currently, we're offering a 6.25% on, uh, on your first uh, Bitcoin that you deposit on the platform and uh, up to nine and a half percent, I shouldn't say up to nine and a half percent on all your USDC you deposit on the platform and that's uh, paid out monthly. And then uh, we also offer um, uh, trading. So it's fee list swaps between uh, USDC and BTC. Um, and so the kind of the big advantage there is, uh, is that you swap directly in between your interest accounts. So you can continue earning interest on them. And then we also do, um, uh, we have lead in loans, which are um, uh, loans that use Bitcoin as collateral. So uh, we have our dollar loans. So if you need access to, uh, you know, to quick dollar liquidity, we can uh, disperse it to you in, uh, in the US dollars by wire bank transfer or by USDC. And we hold Bitcoin uh, as collateral. And uh, once you pay back the loaned amount, we release your Bitcoin back to your control. And uh, so this is a great way if you have, you know, a chunk of Bitcoin and you need access to uh, you know, liquidity, but you don't want to sell, uh, you know, depending on where you live, uh, uh, it, it can be useful for, um, uh, for avoiding triggering a taxable event, for example. And, uh, and then there's also, we also have B2X loans, which allow you to use, um, it's a similar mechanism to the dollar loans, but uh, you, uh, you can use a disbursement to buy more Bitcoin. So you can put up, you know, say half a Bitcoin as collateral, we'll issue you a loan, and uh, we can automate the purchasing of more Bitcoin for you using that loaned amount and then add it to your collateral. So it's a way to effectively uh, uh, double your, uh, your exposure to Bitcoin's price um, and double your Bitcoin holdings. And then once you pay back the loan, the amount of uh, Bitcoin you have gets released back to you. So the price has gone up, you'll end up with more Bitcoin than you started. That's awesome. Uh, that's really cool. I, I, thanks for letting the listeners know what kind of services you offer. Um, I, I think kind of, you know, my audience is kind of more beginners in finance and investing. Mm-hmm. I've kind of gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. So uh, I guess to give my audience uh, a purview or kind of a, an understanding of it, basically, obviously, you know, and I know that when you sell any asset, but particularly Bitcoin, it's seen as right now under the U.S. Co- uh, U.S. code of law that it's seen as property. So in doing so, not only are you hit with uh, potentially long or short term capital gains, it's also assessed as property and you're taxed on that. Uh, so a lot of times what, you know, what millionaires or even billionaires do is obviously they take out loans because you're not taxed on the loans that you take out against. So that's kind of like a service that obviously you provide and help provide liquidity. Yes, you're paying an interest rate of, you know, uh, I guess what would be an interest rate for a loan right now if you were to take one out against Bitcoin? I, I know it, it fluctuates, but what, do you know what it would be offhand? Oh, uh, I believe it's around nine and a half percent. Yeah, but that's that 
uh, pales in comparison to what 22 percent, 24 percent plus whatever your capital gains are. So uh, it's definitely mm. you'd rather pay 24 percent and lose your asset, or you know nine percent, which is much lower by comparison. And obviously, you don't have to pay any of the capital gains. So uh, that's kind yeah, of yeah. I mean, and if you if you expect the price of Bitcoin to to increase by more than that, then you know of course it's preferable to selling even taxable event aside. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for beginners, though, honestly, like the, the interest accounts are probably of more interest, um, mm-hmm. the pun not intended, um, just because it's so simple. You just uh, you create an account. Uh, once you, you you finish KYC process, you get a receiving address, you can send your coins there. And uh, then just every month you get a you get uh, uh, an interest payout and then you can withdraw whenever you like. There's no yeah. lock in period or anything. Yeah, and a quick question for you. So are you guys doing it where obviously uh, you're locking or you're putting in your Bitcoin with you guys? Uh, is there a way to easily see it or access it? Or is it like multi-sigged up? Or is it, can it be re-hypothecated and basically, uh, basically can someone buy Bitcoin from you against the loan and use it to short Bitcoin in theory? Uh, we do loan the coins out. That's okay. uh, how the, that, that is how the, the interest is generated. Um, okay. If uh, if we had to keep the the coins in storage, there would be nowhere to generate interest on it. Yep, so that's exactly. uh, that is the product. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's not. Um, uh, yeah. So that's that's how it's uh, it's generated. We we primarily do it through um, our trading partner Genesis. Although we are we are beginning to explore with our own yield team some very very um, uh, very uh, conservative and cautious strategies uh, that just employ, you know, possessing a little bit of Bitcoin. So people usually think of the, the shorting strategy as the primary source of demand, but that's that's not necessarily it. Uh, yeah, the simple answer is that, yes, the, the coins that you deposit with us are lent out. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So I guess getting more into your background. So I want to kind of sure. go down. What was your journey, journey of getting into yeah, Bitcoin? Actually, yeah, sure. Yeah, I was gonna say one more thing on the point of Leden is um, is uh, oh, one one thing that's exciting that's happening just now. We've only announced it two days ago is that we are running a, a contest for referrals. Um, now this is only available to uh, uh, to citizens of Canada and a, a handful of Latin American countries. But if you do mm-hmm. refer people, you can get entered into a draw to win one Bitcoin. Um, so we are giving one Bitcoin away to a lucky client. So if you are referring people um, during uh, the month of November. Every new person you referred who funds their account to a sufficient amount does can get yourself entered in the draw if you are from one of the available countries. So definitely give us a look there. And even if you're not from one of the, the participating countries, you can. Um, uh, there is a, a ten dollar bonus uh, for uh, for yourself and anyone you refer once they fund the uh, fund an account. So it's um, yeah, just a little bit of incentive there to keep that, going. That, but uh, awesome. yeah, more more than happy more than happy to get into my own story. Yeah, definitely. So if you, I guess you want to go into yourself, how did you find out about Bitcoin? Kind of what were your touch points? And then ultimately what led you for, to pursue not just a career at Lennon, but I know you were also at uh, Blockstream for a few years as well. So what ultimately made you go from, I guess, the fiat world into working for an open source project such as Bitcoin? Yeah, I, well, I was never really part of the fiat world. I, I didn't have, I don't have a background relevant to uh, anything finance or okay. economics or, 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 or coding even. I, I studied classics in university. I was really interested in Roman and Greek history. And then um, I kind of decided to take a year off, went to South Korea to teach English and ended up getting, uh, just ended up getting stuck over there. So I ended up living in Seoul for most of my 20s. And um, I, uh, I was a little bit uh, kind of aimless for a lot of those years and um, and just kind of chance beating. I ended up running into this guy, um, uh, a friend of a friend in a bar who was raving about Bitcoin. This was back in 2015 or so. And I kind of thought, oh, this is kind of interesting, this, you know, money that isn't run by governments, you know, that, but then I, I sort of forgot about it for about a year. And then in 2016, I had a bit of time in my hands and I kind of remembered, pop back into my head and I decided to just check out to see if there was a a uh, beat up group in the area. And there happened to be an English speaking Bitcoin meetup group, uh, but a 15 minute walk from my house in Seoul. And uh, so just, yeah, again, kind of on a whim, I rolled up and uh, I was pretty much hooked from the start. It was it was a small group at the time. It was run by um, a guy called Ruben Thompson, who's become one of my closest friends. Uh, he's one of the other hosts of uh, the podcast I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he was a, a Dutch guy who was living in Korea at the time and was just really interested in Bitcoin. So we had these beatups. We would meet at a coffee shop once a week. And I started showing up. And, you know, the first time I went, I understood maybe 20% of what they were talking about. And they kind of, they gave me some homework. They're like, oh, you know, watch some Andreas Antonopoulos videos. Uh, you know, try and read through the Bitcoin white paper. And here's some other articles. And I, I just, you know, within a few weeks, it was like that was, you know, I would work and then it was Bitcoin time. And I spent a lot of time just, uh, uh, yeah, I like, you know, on Reddit at the time, like nowadays, a lot of the kind of online, news has shifted over to, to Twitter. Uh, back in 2016 or so, uh, Reddit was a place where a lot of uh, a lot of that action happened, Reddit and the um, the old Bitcoin talk forums. And 
and yeah, I uh, decided to take some free coding courses online and uh, uh, studied some cryptography. Uh, Dr. Dan Bona has some great uh, free online cryptography courses if anyone wants to learn. That I, I was surprised it was more accessible than I expected it to be, but I, it was just so exciting that there was this kind of this new thing going on. And because it was so new, there was no there were, there were there were no credentialed gatekeepers you know it was just it was there for anyone to learn and the community was small enough that you if you had meaningful questions to ask you know you know the kind of top people in the field would answer them and uh and i was i was very fortunate that the that ruben and um some of my other friends like sankate and ali and ben were were all like very knowledgeable and they're already kind of held my hand through a lot of it and so that was um yeah that was 2016 2017 while uh while i was still in korea and uh I, I, how long have you been around in this space? Yeah, so I'm very new. I'm class of 2020. So really, uh, okay, all right, yeah. the, the collapse of the equity markets back in March of 2020 really kind of opened up my eyes. I, I said this as a joke, but my claim to fame is I bought Bitcoin three days after Michael Saylor, but I didn't know because he didn't make the announcement until August. He bought it like uh, okay. June 4th. I bought it like June 7th. Um, I bought it on Robinhood, so obviously I made my fair share of mistakes there. I don't have anything in Robinhood now, so I'm got to start right somewhere, though, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I was asking because uh, 20, 2017 was you know quite a tumultuous year. I don't know uh, if you've read the uh, the Block Size War by Jonathan Beer. It's a great account of what happened there. Yeah, I um, haven't yet. It's on my list. Uh, oh, I've read a lot. Of highly that. recommended. Yeah, it's it's the number one book about Bitcoin. I would recommend. It's it's actually the only book book about Bitcoin I've finished, to be honest. Um, but it's it's an excellent read. Um, but at the time there was there was this you know civil war going on in Bitcoin from for about two years and whether or not to increase the block size and um, and our meetup ended up taking a pretty strong stance on that and we uh we wrote a couple articles that got a bit of attention and uh, because of that uh, uh one of uh, Warren Togami uh, from Blockstream happened to be uh, passing through Seoul and came to check out the meetup and I ended up connecting him with there connecting with him there. And, uh, you know, I told him, I was like, you know, Hey, like, I, I don't have any like hard technical skills. Um, you know, I've got a background in humanities. I've been a teacher for a while, but you know, I'm learning to code, but I really, really love to find work somewhere in the space. And I didn't, I wasn't like thinking of trying to join blocks or anything. Cause I didn't think they would have any need for me, but he, um, he was telling me, he's like, you know, it's like, there's a lot of need for people who can communicate well in the space. You don't need to be a developer. And like a lot of the top devs of you know, 20 years experience, it's going to be hard for you catching up at this point. Um, but he was like, you know, like, um, let's keep in touch. And he ended up recommending me for um, the uh, the customer support team lead position at uh, Blockstream. So I ended up joining in early 2018. And uh, so a lot of my work there was doing a support for the uh, for the Blockstream Green wallet, uh, which is, uh, yeah, it was quite interesting doing support for non-custodial wallet. Um, lots of, uh, uh, yeah, lots of interesting challenges we can get into there, if you like. Um, and then also worked pretty closely with uh, Samson Mo and the marketing team. Um, so I got to be... Um, uh, it was one of the, the people who were helping run the uh, the Lightning Store and when Lightning Network transactions first started getting accepted. Uh, yep. That was one of the first things I was doing. And um, so, that, yeah, that was that was really thrilling. I got to work there for about just over three years until earlier this year when um, uh, when I joined the Leaden team. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a really cool career. And you definitely had your fair share of, you know, obviously you got to see the, uh, you know, the, the highs of 2017 into beginning of 2018, and then ultimately the crash. And now you've worked through basically, you've worked through a full cycle, which is really cool. So I bet it's, it's cool to kind of see your work come to fruition. And you're kind of on the back end of another bull market, which I bet is really cool. And it's hard to fathom, but I guess it, it's very interesting. I, I don't know if you want to expand on that or add to that. Yeah, I mean, like, um, that's, that's a good question, actually, like, I, I don't usually get asked that I, um, it's, yeah, I guess it's a bit different the second time around, just because you've you've kind of seen it. Um, on the uh, like on the other hand, I'm I'm a bit cautious about being like, oh yeah, there's gonna be these four year cycles forever. Like I'm not, it might not work out like that. We might see these weird like three year cycles, and it might break the pattern. Like, uh, you know, I guess that a lot of that comes down to the question of like, are the happenings priced in or not? And um, uh, but uh, yeah, one one thing that is interesting, which uh, I guess you've only experienced the bull market, hey? Yeah, pretty uh, much. It's. Yeah, it's 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 very different in the bear market. Uh, in some ways, it's really good in that um, in that the the people that you tend to attract that are new and coming in during bear markets, I find uh, tend to be uh, a lot more likely to stick around long term because they tend to be interested in it for different reasons than just like oh this thing's going up and I want in. Like they're not just in it for the FOMO. And like there are people like that who like not everyone who comes into bull markets in for the FOMO, but they um you're more likely to people who show up during bear markets are often more selected to be interested in for, uh, you know, different reasons. 
And, um, and also because there's not as much kind of crazy stuff happening in media, it is a bit of a period where it's like a lot easier to keep your head down and work. Like, you know, for the last year and a half, it's, it's just like social media is so much more distracting. You know, it's really hard not focusing on the price a lot. Whereas that was like a non-issue in like 2019, 2018. It was just like price was kind of tanking. So you didn't really, you weren't or, really or obsessively checking how much you lost. The line, yeah, exactly. You know, and so it was kind of easy to just ignore it and get stuff done. Um, whereas there's, there's a lot more distractions during bull markets. So there's pros and cons, you know, bull markets are fun because, you know, numbers going up, like, uh, uh, people are making money. So, you know, euphoria is high. Um, uh, but, you know, as long as you have a long, you, you take a sufficient long, uh, long-term perspective on it, you don't expect quick gains. If you, you know, understand that you're going to have to deal with kind of these 80% price swings, including the down ones. If you're kind of meant to be prepared for that, the bear markets are nice in their own way. They, uh, yeah. 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 In some ways, in some ways we kind of miss them, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, the bull markets are fun. Definitely. And it's it's funny you should say that. So like I was kind of sold on Bitcoin back. So I saw the, I'll give you a little, I guess, a little, I guess a little bit of a background on me. So I was kind of always liked investing. I went to school for chemical engineering, but I've always had like an investing or finance uh, passion or what I liked. So I really started this podcast in November of 2020. And, uh, but I was kind of always into it even before that I graduated from college in 2015. And um so I was more of the traditional guy that was like sticking in a 401k, watching the S&P 500, you know, your normalized growth. And ultimately I opened up a Robinhood account in probably 2017, 2018. I was kind of stock picking and I was doing pretty well. You know, I get, a, there's, I, everyone gets burned in, in investing. Like I, I bought nickel and watched that tank. So luckily it wasn't life-changing money, but it was enough to still- Nickel, hurt. like like the metal. Yes. Uh, Nicola, Nicola, like the, the oh, stock- okay. The, the company oh, okay. Like I, I, th- I, th- I thought you meant nickel. I thought you bought a chunk of like the metal no, nickel. No, I was like, no, that's no. interesting. Usually no. people buy gold or platinum or silver. Okay, okay. Nickel. No, no, no. Yeah. Like yeah. nickel, the company yeah. that's uh, the EV company that says that they're yeah. like uh, Tesla, but they have no sales or anything. But anyway, so yeah. I, I went into Robinhood and um, <clears throat> ultimately I was picking like uh, single equities, you know, uh, and not just like the blue chip ones, ones that were like low or not penny stocks, but ones that were much lower valuation that I think could go somewhere. And I had, I did something as a mistake. It was actually in one of my episodes, like four or five, when Ben and I talked about our mistakes um, in that I mentioned that I set stop losses. So my stocks had gone up about 50%, 40% over the course of a couple of years. So pretty decent returns, about 10% or whatever, or at least decent returns for the fiat world. And hmm. um, in January of 2020, I watched as my entire portfolio get liquidated. So basically, like, let's say the stock was at $100. It had ridden up. I set a stop loss at $96 or $95, let's just say. And yeah. I watched as every single position I had across all sectors get liquidated. And I was like, and this was in January of 2020. So I'm like, something's definitely up in the world. And I just kind of like- Well, you say, you say liquidated though, but like you, you'd still- came away with a pretty healthy profit yes, though, right? Because, exactly. Okay, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah, let's just yeah. say I bought it at 50 bucks. It had ridden to a hundred bucks, but I was setting mm. stop losses that in the, yeah. in the event that it went down, I was going to liquidate and lock in. That was smart down. though. You, you got out then like, yeah, yeah, it, you didn't exactly. write them down. Yeah. yeah. So I watched as it get liquidated and I'm kind of waiting the U S market kind of like, it was kind of like it bounced back up and I'm like, Oh, maybe I should invest in, but I just kind of waited. And then I watched in March as everything went red and then kind of in Warren Buffett style, I know he hate him and Charlie hate Bitcoin, but they were kind of always like if Target or if a store that you love was having a 50% off sale or 70% off sale, why would you like run the other direction? Like that's what people do in mm-hmm. equity markets or stock market or, or anything in trading. Yeah. But like if they had a sale, everyone's running to the store to go buy stuff. So I watched as it liquidated. I waited probably end of March, uh, early to mid April. And then I was like, all right, this is my time to strike. So then I started putting money, half of it back in in April. And then by June 1st, I had put everything back in my Robinhood account back in. And part of that was in June, I had bought a little bit of Bitcoin. I'm like, Hey, like this is another asset class. I'll try this. And then that's kind of, uh, what really got me into it. I've said this a couple of times is I listened to, we study billionaires. So Preston Pish and Stig Broderson, I was like listening for more of their equities and, you know, talking about financial markets. And I had heard a couple of episodes about Bitcoin, but I just kind of like brushed it off. There's another guy, um, to- Tobias Carlisle, and he always says shorts and shorting is not my game. So I just kind of like Bitcoin and, and shorting. That's not my game. Like I'll listen, but just, I- I'm not, I'm not in that game. So anyway, so but Bitcoin and shorting were like the same category. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. 
So, um, so in episode, they always do a quarterly mastermind meeting. So where they meet every quarter and they say, okay, this is, you know, Jerome Powell does a speech every quarter, talk about inflation, yada, 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 job market, all that. And they would do their picks for the, for the upcoming quarter. So in that one quarter in April, uh, or, or I guess March or April, Preston brought up Bitcoin and I was like, okay, like, you know, I'll hear him out, but you know, I, I'm not going to touch it. It's like just to, uh, Tobias with the shorting. I'm not going to do that. I'm listening to Stig's pick and they also have Ari on. And so I this is uh, April, April, 2020, yeah? a- April of 2020. So March it was, April. it was like a month after that, like massive dip, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why okay. I really yeah, wanted man. to hear their picks. I'm like, okay, well, this is a time to buy. I'm, I'm interested to see what they're going to say. And Toby was saying to short Netflix, which I agree with his analysis of the stock, but I'm like, just with, I knew something was wrong with the money printing and like, like Netflix, even though it doesn't have, I don't want to say they don't have a good business model. They, they do, but like, they're always losing money. Like they're never making money. They're just taking on more and more debt. And yeah, they have a lot, a large user base. So they're getting a lot of cash flow, but they're operating in the negative. So I agreed with his, uh, you know, idea of everything, but Preston brought up Bitcoin and I literally was pushing it off. I'm like, okay, I'm not shorting Netflix. I'm not doing Bitcoin. And, you know, I watched as Netflix went to new highs as all this money printing was going on. I'm like, all right, well, that was smart. But then Bitcoin was going up and I'm like, okay, it's kind of going up like parabolically or, or it's like, it's very different. I don't know. So then I didn't think anything of it. And I was buying, just like I said, in Robinhood, all this stuff. And then in June, uh, they did their next quarterly mastermind or like at end of May or early June. And they, they talked about Bitcoin again. And I'm like, okay, I've never heard. And I, they started in 2014, 2015. I've been listening like a lot of the episodes from that time, listening to a lot of their episodes. I, I was almost caught up. And I had never heard them suggest the same stock or investment in the same like two quarters back to back. Like Stig suggested okay. Google in like 2014 and then again in 2018. I'm like, okay, well, like that makes sense. Like that's cool. But like Preston went back to back quarters of suggesting Bitcoin. And I'm like, shit, I missed something. Something's up. I need to investigate this a lot more. So I put a, a small trade in. I bought Bitcoin on Robinhood. And then that's immediately when I went to go buy the Bitcoin standard and kind of go down the rabbit hole of looking into everything I can. I'm like, I definitely missed something because I really respect Preston and Stig and all their opinions. But I'm like, what am I missing that Preston's suggesting it twice? And then that's kind of ultimately led me going down the rabbit hole. And uh, sorry for that long winded story, but basically. No, no, no. And then uh, that kind of went me down the rabbit hole. And then I was kind of telling everyone about it. And it's funny, you should say in bull markets that, you know, it's really happy and awesome. And that's true. Like when it wrote up to 50K and then up to 55, 57, I was telling all my friends to get in. And then of course, like people, I had a couple of friends buy it at 62, 64, right, right at that peak. And then all of a sudden it withdraws down to like 30 or 29K. And mm. I, you know, that's when you, when you start having to explain to your friends, I'm like, listen, like, I know I told you you bought it. You just took a 50% haircut on like your, your fiat gains or even more. I'm like, but listen to like Warren Buffett. I even had to send some of them just like, listen, I I'm still buying, like, this is a better time to buy than when it was at 60 K. And ultimately I, I helped a lot of my friends. None of them panic sold, which I feel really accomplished about. And nice. ultimately they bought in more and now we're back to where we were. And they're like, we made gains as we were buying all the way down at the bottom and then all the way back up. So now we're, you know, we've kind of lowered our cost basis and in theory we've made money. And uh, yeah, so they were very happy. We're very happy to be sitting at this, but even if they were correct again, uh, you know, I'm even prepping them. I'm like, even if it falls the four year cycles, you know, we could see a 90 to a 70% correction in theory. Um, So I prepped a lot of them and they understand it. And I've basically given them enough knowledge to get to the basis of what Bitcoin is, why it's important, the censorship of it, the, you know, just the madness of going on in the world. Like you need money that can't be confiscated, can't be corrupted and, uh, and uh, you know, that you can operate yourself and you can't get locked out of. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, that's a big thing. Whenever I'm introducing people to space, like if I'm, you know, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time convincing people to buy. I'll just kind of make occasional nudges now and then I'll put feelers out. And if someone shows interest, I'll kind of focus on them. Um, but I, I always kind of make sure to be like, you know, just so you know, this is like, this is a five-year investment. Don't expect a return in the next like few months. I have no idea what's going to do short term. My confidence about it going up is is much longer term, like five, 10 year horizons. And I'm like, well, you know, it might crash to 50% tomorrow. So I always kind of make sure I kind of coach people through that before they buy. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, I haven't followed up, followed up with everyone I've helped buy it, but I, I think, um, I think, yeah, uh, if people go in with that mentality, then they're able to weather the storms pretty well. Yeah. I completely agree. And uh, even mm-hmm. to your point, I, I think when you're explaining to people, it kind of uh, has a better understanding of 
um, where they're coming from and, and not to say like along political lines if, if they're more conservative or liberal or but just like if they have a bigger issue for the environment let's just say you're like well bitcoin's mm. actually helping use wasted energy that we'd otherwise waste and they're like oh that's interesting and you can send them an article that way or if they're yeah have you seen about- that uh have you seen that that small paper that square crypto put together um, no i have not no I've heard i'll of- uh I'll- yeah. Yeah. I'll, well, I'll, I'll find a link you we can share in the description, but it's excellent. It's, it's just like a little summary of just like, um, you know, different ways that uh, the Bitcoin energy can affect the energy mix. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite good. Definitely. Yeah. And like, but I've, I've even found like, just based on what people are coming from background, like, oh, they don't want the government to touch their money. So that might be more of a libertarian or conservative mindset. You know, if they think it's a waste of energy or it's bad for the environment, you can do more of like how it's actually helping the environment. It's making us more sustainable and more green, you know, and mm. there's all these different lenses based on if you, some people are like, I want to get rich quick scheme. It's like, all right, well, it w- will, it may go up, but it may crash down. So like, I guess, I guess there's different touch points and what people are interested in or what really can attract them. And then ultimately as they go more down the rabbit hole, uh, they come to an understanding of what money is, how, what Bitcoin is, how is Bitcoin's hard money, how it's, you know, censorship resistant money, um, and then just kind of all the nuances of it, because there is definitely a lot. Yeah, 100%. It's, um, have you seen that? Uh, I think Jameson Lop made this uh, chart, but it's like you got the x-axis and the y-axis and the uh, the x-axis is, is um, time that's passed. The y-axis is how well you think you understand Bitcoin. And typically people like, you know, they think they understand Bitcoin better, better, better. And then you get to this point where you're like, you realize how much more there's to understand and your <laughs> perceived understanding goes down again. And uh, I, yeah, it's just, there, there's never ending amount of stuff to learn. It's uh, That was one of the things that really attracted me to, it to, to me at the beginning was um, just the fact that it was um, uh, kind of a combination of different fields. You can't be too specialized to un- like, um, to 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 understand it as a whole, you know, you need to understand. Uh, uh, well, I mean, you don't need to understand all this to use it, but um, uh, there is so much to understand. You know, to do with networking, to do with computer science, to do with cryptography, with uh, monetary policy. There's the whole kind of social layer to it, and economics. And I I, I really love that aspect of it. There's just there's a never ending amount of stuff uh, to keep learning about it. Yeah, definitely, I completely agree. And like I said, I'm a chemical engineer by by degree. Uh, but I, I don't have a very strong coding background. Uh, that just kind of, mm. I had one coding class in college and I did all right, but it was just not my passion. But exactly like you said, there's history to it. There's monetary policy. You know, you're kind of then studying also empires and as they're collapsing, I know, um, uh, what's his name? Mark, um, oh my God. He was just on, I'm drawing a blank on him now. Um, Mark. Are you talking about the guy from Bridgewater? No, 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 no. Not Mark Yusko. Um, I'm going to look this up right now. Uh, Mark Moss. There we go. Mark Moss kind of talks about uh, he has, you know, he studied history and that there's like 20 year business cycles and then four 20 year cycles encompass an 80 year cycle. And then he was talking about empires. Normally you have four 80 year cycles. Oh, yeah. Uh, to, and then we're kind of on the precipice of coming down to the bottom of a cycle for an empire, meaning the United States. It's a, the end of an 80-year cycle, potentially going into a recession or depression, and it's the end of the business cycle. So it's the end of a 20-year, the end of an 80-year, and then- Is that the, uh, the the fourth turning? Is that what they're calling yep, it? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And, and it's not an exact science of like every mm. you know 20 years or 80 years, but it's very close to what all of those hitting at the same time. Typically, empires last anywhere from 200 to 300 years. We're at like 250 mm. right now with the United States, You know, the end of an 80-year business cycle, the end of a 20-year cycle right now, if you're- starting at you know the 2000s the uh and it was kind of a half cycle because of the 2000 mm. financial crisis but if you think of the the internet um craze and when when the stock market crashed in the early to late uh 90s and early 2000s that was kind of another one so uh it's just very interesting like you said like there's cryptography there's computer science there's history there's monetary economics there's social economics um it's it just it's endless and you know the are, more are you Go ahead. I was just saying, are you familiar with Ray Dalio and his yes. work? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and he, he kind of, uh, he doesn't quite use the exact same framework, but he, he kind of looks at things through his lens as well. Yeah, I find his stuff pretty interesting. Definitely. Even though he's he's kind of funny, he's almost like, he really seems like a Bitcoiner, but he's not quite yet, yet, I mean, you know? He's yeah. like kind of one of the most successful, I mean, hedge funds and not even that, just like bond traders mm-hmm. in terms of what he did for his hedging of using bonds with equities. But, you know, yeah. he's come out recently saying, like, I'd rather own Bitcoin than a bond. 
but then he kind of retraces yeah. a few weeks or a few months later saying oh but if yeah. it gets too big you know the chinese government and the u.s government's going to stop it so he yeah exactly what you said he kind of dances a fine line on both sides yeah. to keep everyone happy but it's just it's very interesting the way that he looks mm. at it i know his video on youtube how the economic machine works is about a 32 minute video i suggest everyone that listens to this podcast or anyone look it up it's it teaches you more about economics in a 30 minute video than i would say an economics degree and that's not to downplay anyone that in the economics field but it's just so informative it tells you about credit tells you about debit tells you about how the government borrows tell, talks about the federal reserve and he does just a very thorough job of it all in that video yeah it's uh yeah it's interesting work i've seen it as well uh with the historical stuff i i i find myself a little bit more skeptical of a lot of those claims just because it might be the bias because of what i studied because i was really into roman history and rome lasted about a thousand years from like its supposed founding until it's uh it's fall and you know like of course they're gonna be exceptions to every rule but i um i uh yeah it's it, it really does seem as though history is accelerating in a lot of ways though uh uh you know considering these uh these kind of cultures how long they would last and uh, you know, how long, um, uh, you know, the British Empire lasted compared to the United States and uh, lots of interesting questions around like, is the United States really an empire? It kind of depends on you to find it. It definitely isn't, you know, doesn't uh, manage overseas holdings in the same way that a lot of um, its uh, previous empires did. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that's one thing that's so tough about history is that, you know, you don't have this controlled environment to run experiments in. So it's not, it's a lot harder to test these things. Um, but yeah, it's going to be an interesting decade or two. That's, that's for sure. So that's funny you should say that. So uh, I, I don't know if you've read The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth. I actually haven't, but I've done enough research or I kind of know the synopsis Not yet, of it. no. Um, so, well, okay. So then I'll describe kind of what Jeff was talking about in it. So he's saying The Price of Tomorrow, obviously it's talking about what we're doing in terms of central uh, banking and printing of money and QE or UBI or any of those. But basically we're always stealing from the future and pulling it into the present when you're taking out a loan or, or so, something uh, you, when, you're, when you're taking out money, it, you're pulling money, loans, or fiat into the future or into the present, and you're stealing from your future. And we've kind of seen that play out over the last 50 years. But in the book, I know a big preface of it was Jeff was talking about we've seen things have accelerated or gotten worse because technology is very deflationary. So as you know, the iPhone or the smartphones or computers, as these technologies are getting better, faster, they're, they're getting cheaper. They're kind of falling. Um, what is it? Um, not... Not Murphy's law, the other law. Mo uh, Moore's law. Moore's law. Thank you. The Moore's yeah. law that basically, like in uh, what is it, in a year's time, your uh, hardware is going to be half as expensive and twice. Uh, I think yeah, roughly, expensive. roughly every roughly every four years, you can fit twice the number of transistors on a chip. Yeah. Ex exactly. So what he was saying, as as that's pushing things to get faster and cheaper and you know more abundant, at the same time we're printing money. He's he thought if we were kind of more in like you know the fifties or sixties, this money printing could go on much longer because. Um, as technology is creating things so cheap, so fast that they have to print money in order to meet the demand or their, their debt obligations. So they need inflation to pay back with cheaper dollars versus if they saw deflation, which technology is causing, that means that the government would be the ones getting screwed on the loans and, you know, on the back of the American people. So that's kind of the, just the premise. Like I said, I really need to read the book, but I know he was saying, you know, Technology is pushing us extremely deflationary while we're trying to print money and pump money into the economy through stocks, equities, bonds, whatever it may be, uh, to try and counteract back or counterbalance the uh, what's going on, basically. So, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy stuff. Um, I, I don't know if there's any expansion on that. And so maybe that's why the Roman Empire lasted a thousand years, where if you're saying the United States only lasted 250 or, you know, and I've even heard with the Roman Empire, 500 of those years, their money was pretty sound in terms of like there wasn't really clipping of the money or debasement of the money. And then ultimately they started to fall apart when they started to go to wars and then, you know, uh, clipping um, the coins and stuff. I, I don't know if you. you no, I, I've heard those theories. I, I don't subscribe to them. I think in general, um, when it comes to historical explanations, people tend to um, think that they're more monocausal than they are. Mm -hmm. You know, the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire involved a tremendous number of a whole bunch of other effects compounding. And I don't think it makes sense to point to any single one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also definitely not true that um, that uh, kind of debasement only happened during a particular period. Like it it did get kind of kicked into high gear during certain periods. Um, but I don't think I, I don't think it would make sense to lay the primary blame there. Uh, although an interesting anecdote is uh, if you're aware of on um, 
kind of on, on the edges of the coins we use today, you've got those little ridges on them. Yeah. That's because the, you know, in ancient times, they used to kind of uh, scrape off little bits of gold or silver dust on them. And so they added those ridges to say that, you know, this, this coin only has its value if the, the ridges are intact. Uh, uh, yes. I just, I, I thought that was so interesting. Like when I remember when I was a kid, when I learned that looking at like, you know, our Canadian quarter and seeing the ridges and like, Hey, we still have those, even though, you know, the actual, you know, the, the metal in the coins we use today is worth, you know, a tiny fraction of what the coins themselves are actually worth. But uh, it's kind of fun how those, uh, those little things last stand the test of time. But yeah, no, in general, I, I find that like, um, yeah, the, these things tend to, you know, something involved like a, like you know the the strength of an empire. Just it's it's got so many factors involved into it. I think I, I'm hesitant to point to any single one as the dominant cause, but uh, uh, but you know it all it all factors in together. It's it's definitely plays a role. Definitely, and like I said, you would have a better understanding of me. And uh, it wasn't only debasement of currency. It definitely was a, sure, a bunch sure. of different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, kind of spreading mm-hmm. themselves too thin. Debasement of currency. Um, you know, I definitely think a lot of people that were under the rule of the Roman Empire kind of did not want to be under the rule of the Roman Empire. So, like you said, I guess that kind of factors into mm-hmm. being, um, you know, spreads it too thin and not being able to rule over all of that area. And uh, it, it is very cyclical, though. I mean, you look at any of the empires that yeah. have, you know, risen and then fallen. It's it is, you know, what goes up must come down eventually. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. So I guess I guess segueing to the next thing. So this is something that I, a new question that I'd like to start asking to to people on the podcast. What's your favorite? Oh, I get to be first. What? I get to be first. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite design feature of Bitcoin? Favorite design feature of Bitcoin. Um, and that's a great question. Um, I've, yeah. Again, I haven't thought about those terms before. Favorite design feature. I think. Um, the it's hard to narrow down what specific design feature this is because it gets at so many different design features together but just the fact that the way that it manages to be incentive compatible Mm -hmm. and there are so many there's so many things about it like um you know the 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 original kind of byzantine generals problem the double spend problem of like how do you reach alignment on um on a um uh, agreement with the state of a network without a central authority, you can mathematically prove that it's impossible to solve that problem. Um, and, and it's impossible to actually solve that problem with certainty. But instead, what happens is Bitcoin is incentive compatible such that um, each new block that's added is more and more likely to be the agreed upon state of the network. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't ever quite get to a point where like there is no, like Bitcoin is not technically immutable 100%. Instead, it's just so statistically um, likely to be immutable by the, um, by the way the incentives line up. So I, I just love that it's, um, there's this problem that's solved not in the direct, like we have this kind of mechanical issue for it or mechanical solution for it, but it's, it's, it's solved in an incentive compatible way such that it would be technically possible um, for you know, someone, you know, for these miners to rewrite blocks, but there's there the incentives are aligned such that you can uh, be confident that they won't. And and I, I really I really love that. I, I and I, I don't know what what to point to specifically. It is a design feature because and I almost feel like I'm cheating because that kind of is the central point of Bitcoin. But um, that's uh, that, that's the answer you're gonna get. All right, I like that. That's a good one. Um, I guess uh, continuing off that, what do you think Bitcoin's doing for the world on a macro scale? Um, so I think that. Um, the, the part of Bitcoin I'm most interested in is, um, yeah, the fact that it's it's a great equalizer in terms of um, access to digital money um, around the world. And, um, you know, digital money has existed for decades, but before we had this solution to the double spend problem, before we had Bitcoin, you had to access digital money through a trusted authority. And that means that if you don't have uh, the infrastructure set up in places, you just don't have access to digital banking. And, you know, there's so many billions of people in the world today who don't have access to digital banking. And now we have a way to um, give that to people um, as long as they have a cell phone and internet access. And, you know, and like, again, there are billions of people today that still don't have internet access either, but that's rapidly changing, you know, especially with the progress that SpaceX is making with their Starlink. It's been real exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, um, and, you know, cell phone usage is becoming really pervasive, even among, you know, the, uh, even among the, the global poor, um, it's, it's just becoming more and more common to have one. And so the, the fact that, you know, we can have, you know, you're able to send and receive value and, um, and you don't need to rely on someone else to do it. That's, that's absolutely beautiful to me. Like for me, that's like, that's where it really hits home. Like even more so than, um, 
stuff like it. I mean, it's it's great as an investment as well. Don't get me wrong. I like that part is cool too. But um, many things are great investments. Um, but like being able to, uh, you know, kind of uh, you know reach these parts of the world that otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, that that's huge. And you know, especially for us as well. Like, I mean, I've led a lot of our client base is Latin American based. One of our co-founders is uh, was born and raised in Venezuela, and you know, and see, he saw you know firsthand you know how abuse of the monetary system can really you know destroy an economy and um, and still today, like a large portion of our, our clients are based in Latin America. And the fact that we're able to bring basic financial services to people who where it's otherwise not available for them, either because, you know, the money has been screwed with or just because they, you know, just because basic, basic banking services aren't, you know, up to that level. Like we, we get people telling us we are the first people that have approved a loan for them. And that's like, that's what gets me up out of bed in the morning. It's, um, it's, it's really great to be working on something like that. That's awesome. Yeah, you're based out of Canada, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, right? You're in Canada? that's that's correct. Yeah, I, I live in Canada, and Leden's uh, uh, headquarters is here. Uh, most of our team is here, um, yeah. but uh, a, a large portion of our team are actually um, uh, native Spanish and Portuguese speakers, um, and about like so. Um, yeah, a, a lot of them live in Toronto, but we also have uh, uh, kind of employees and clients in you know Venezuela and uh, Mexico and in Spain and Brazil. Yep. Yeah. So, but I mean, I guess I, the point I was trying to make is that, you know, I'm based in the United States, you're based in Canada and we were kind of, we're fortunate. We're part of the G7 nations or the, we are very privileged, yeah, very privileged yeah. in terms of not just from um, just from, you know, the, the, the blessings of being in North America, but just from, you know, the amount of financial privilege that we have over the rest of the world, exactly. Like you said, Venezuela, Absolutely. Argentina, Greece, uh, Brazil, uh, you know, the list goes on in Nigeria, um, you know, India, even to, to, to an extent. And uh, we're just very lucky that, I mean, even when you talk about El Salvador, you know, they obviously in uh, the, the Bitcoin conference, they announced that they were going to make Bitcoin legal tender and ultimately did so in, uh, was it September 9th, September 7th, something like some date like that. I should probably know it off the back of my hand or, uh, but basically like they, you know, they have a population of 6 million and of that less than half of them were, uh, were banked. I think only 70, uh, 30% of the country is banked. The other 70% is unbanked. But um, now with making Bitcoin legal, legal tender, I know that they have over uh, 3 million wallets of a population of 6 million. So, uh, you know, that means that ultimately more than half the population at this point now is able to have financial freedom in the sense through Bitcoin. And ultimately, uh, you know, their government, uh, I won't talk about Bukele, whether you love him or hate him for his political beliefs or what he's done in the past, but ultimately for Bitcoin, uh, I definitely think that is one of the positive things on his resume. Uh, you know, I know some people argue about forcing people to use it, but it kind of seems that they are, even if you don't want to hold Bitcoin and you want to hold U.S. dollars, they're giving you the option to sell it at time of sale and, and take on to U.S. dollars because mm -hmm. that's what they're a dollarized nation. Um, yeah, it's it's been interesting seeing the the libertarian debates on whether or not uh, it was a good moral thing to force people to accept Bitcoin. I uh, I I'm not I'm not an anarchist myself. Like I have many libertarian leanings, but I am I am uh, okay with certain levels of government. So for me, this wasn't I I didn't have any. There was no tension over that for me. But it was kind of funny seeing the the different characters online duke it out over that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and it's pretty funny, too, because uh, I had Adam Meister on a couple episodes ago, and uh, mm -hmm. he was talking about um, him in particular. So he's an avid Bitcoiner. And it was funny. He talked about this crypto dividend. And I thought, like, I was like, oh, Adam, like, what's this? Like, this seems kind of like you're altcoining or you're not for, to saying for Bitcoin. He's like, no, I will gladly accept payment in any form, but just know that it's going to be flipped into Bitcoin as soon as it happens. Yeah. So his podcast and YouTube channel that he runs, he has uh, a Litecoin address. He has, he has all these different addresses. He's like, you want to pay me or tip me and whatever, just know as soon as I receive it and I know that I have it, I'm flipping it into Bitcoin. Uh, and so that's kind of the way that he views using his Bitcoin. And he's like, I consider a crypto dividend. If anyone wants to give a book, Bitcoin holder another type of coin or drop it among them among, in the chain, he's like, we're the best holders in the game. So, you know, we'll gladly take the donations and put them into Bitcoin. Uh, so I think yeah, it's just... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there's a buddy of mine, uh, Mike Olthoff, who runs a runs a, a site called uh, CoinCards.com, where you can kind of use a uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to get gift cards to allow you to spend it that way. Um, and he, he's taken some flack from the the purists before because he does accept several altcoins. But he's like, you know, if people want to pay me in it, I'm converting it straight into Bitcoin. That's what I'm doing with it. Like, you know, we're just just selling it. And yeah, you, know, you know, people go back and forth on whether or not he's like, you know, uh, whether it counts as kind of tacit approval for these other coins or not. But uh, you know, it's a uh, it's uh, 
it's kind of funny the, the different uh, perspectives you get on it for sure i've never I, i've never never run a store myself so i uh, yeah. well i mean i guess I, like yeah we're not my own anyways um and uh so i've never never had to make that choice but uh, i kind of i kind of understand where both sides are coming from in that one exactly if, if you want to pay me in any type of form of payment if it's easy enough to convert it to something else uh it's willing to be done um so yeah. i guess I, I know that you so taproot so i know well, let's uh, rewind a little bit. So Bitcoin, sure. obviously, uh, you know, it is an open source protocol and, you know, there's kind of always been development on Bitcoin. We really haven't seen any upgrades or updates in it since uh, from the, uh, what is it? The, the uh, Segwit. Fork, the, the Segwit and not even that, just the, the hard fork that was Bitcoin Cash um, and ultimately, you know, the, uh, the block size war. Um, so a lot of that went down and ultimately we got SegWit as part of it. And then also the Lightning Network started in, I think the paper was released in 2017 and then started in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, uh, not quite. So the paper is actually quite old. The paper was released in 2015. Okay. Um, and Lightning itself was not, uh, was not a fork or an update to Bitcoin. Um, once uh, SegWit enabled Lightning... Okay. Well, actually, technically, like technically speaking, Lightning would have been possible before Segwit, but Segwit made Lightning much more feasible, and so a lot of the development on Lightning was being tested on the assumption Segwit would get added later, and then once Segwit was added, um, uh, it, that was a few months later. You saw Lightning Network being used, um, but uh, that's the, that's one of the beauties of Lightning is that it actually didn't require any extra changes to the underlying protocol. Uh, Segwit is something we would have wanted to add regardless of Lightning, um, but Segwit was the last um, update to the protocol rules. Um, I, I I will point out that um, Bitcoin Core, like the the software, the kind of backbone of the the Bitcoin network, is constantly getting updates to it. Uh, but most of the updates don't affect the consensus layer. The consensus layer being the the rules about what transactions are or not valid, what blocks are and are not valid. Those are consensus rules and are very, very, um, uh, you have to be very, very careful at updating them because if the network does isn't unified on the update, there's a risk of the chain splitting. And, um, and uh, but any updates to the to Bitcoin Core that don't affect consensus code um, can be rolled out kind of asynchronously. And so there's constant updates and efficiency improvements going on to Bitcoin Core that the, the developers are, work very hard on. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the the, the Bitcoin pro the consensus protocol uh, rules those uh, those are the kind of big ones that we only have every few years now. Yeah. So if you if you don't mind, if you want to describe SegWit real quick, and then I know Taproot's coming up in uh, the next couple of weeks. By the time this episode airs, it'll probably be a week out. Um, so if you if you don't mind describing SegWit real quick and as simple as sure. possible, I know it's complex, and then ultimately go into Taproot. What's going to be rolling out in the middle of November? Sure. Um. So man, it's been a while since I've uh, I've explained SegWit. Actually, this is um, getting a bit of nostalgia here. We um. So SegWit is uh, short for segregated witness. Um. And it's an update that separates uh, the data from transactions into two pieces. And it does this so that uh, the a transactions um, transaction ID can't get altered. Um, so before SegWit, you just had all the information for a transaction, including the witness data, which is primarily the, the digital signature that proves that the um, person spending the, the transaction is the person allowed to spend it. Um, there used to be, uh, with the signatures, there's a way that you can kind of tweak the signatures. Um, and have them still be valid, even if you're not the person who sent it. So let's say you had this transaction you want to broadcast and you sent it to the network and I saw that transaction. I could tweak a little bit of the data in the signature and then it would still be the same transaction that would do the same things. But because the data is different, the transaction ID would be different. And um, for your ordinary transaction, um, this might not seem like a big problem, but it makes, uh, it makes wallet software a lot harder to write and a lot of use cases that rely on you knowing what a transaction ID is before it's been confirmed, uh, it really limits those um, and kind of makes certain things impossible. So the, the segregated witness, what it did is it actually separated it out, segregated the, um, the witness data, the, the, the signatures, and um, it said the transaction ID only um, is created from the, from the non-witness data and because that stuff can't get altered in any way. Um, and so now when, uh, if, if you were to actually look at the raw data from a block, you would have kind of the block header and then a whole bunch of transaction data. And then afterwards, all of the witness data, all the signatures um, okay. for the segregate transactions um, uh, afterwards. And so this, this prevented what's called transaction malleability. That's the, um, the changing of the, um, of the, uh, the transaction ID. Um, before it's confirmed, so that's like a little bit into the weeds, um, and it had a it had a couple of other um, of other uh, uh, minor improvements that they were able to bundle together 
Um, and so it stopped this uh, quadratic hashing issue, which could um, uh, would allow for scenarios someone could create like a really, really big transaction that would end up uh, taking an extraordinarily long amount of time to, to validate. So this is a bit of a weakness and that issue was solved. And uh, it was also it also included a block size increase. Um, uh, so transactions or you know blocks can now on like full blocks now can get up to around you know two and a half megabytes, whereas before it was only one megabyte. So it did offer some scalability improvements there. Um, it, it's kind of funny that that got lost a little bit in the weeds because the um, the the uh, those of us who were pro SegWit uh, tend to be considered the small blockers and didn't want just like a big increase to the block size. And so um, uh, and the the kind of the opposing side, the big blockers. Um, weren't satisfied with SegWit. They thought it was, uh, most of them thought it was a poor idea for various reasons. But in fact, SegWit was a, a block size increase. It did um, kind of uh, increase scalability that way. Um, but yeah, the main thing it did, fixing transaction malleability was it was a big deal and kind of allowed for all sorts of second layer technologies uh, like Lightning Network, for example, to be built on top of it. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, there's an overview of SegWit. Yeah, and then uh, if you want to go into a breakdown of Taproot, so that's uh, obviously... I, I was kind of new to coming into it. So I heard about it in probably March or April of this year. Obviously, we had a lot of the miners that we, they started to uh, signal for uh, activation, which is basically, I guess, uh, Bitcoin Core or the development team sent out that they were sending to the miners or the people that were mining Bitcoin that like you have to uh, initiate and say, we're ready to accept Taproot. Um, and you either do a green light or a red light. I know in early June, you kind of saw as people are showing as the mempool was filling up, whether they're red or green. And uh, ultimately, mm -hmm. even some of the miners were not signaling for taproot and people were uh, harassing them online saying, you know, why aren't you upgraded? Why aren't you ready? And I, I think the lock in period was end of August. I think we locked in much earlier than that, though, probably. We did. Uh, yeah, we locked in pretty quickly. And we, it was what, middle to end of June. So it started early June and then locked in. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was around there. It was, um, it, it was. I think it was just a bit before the um, the, the Miami conference. So I think it was actually late, um, late May, if I remember correctly. But um, yeah. yeah, that was, um, that was. There was quite a bit of contention going on in the spring about how we should roll out the update because the the SegWit update, due to kind of all the uh, conflicts going on at the time, ended up being very difficult and ended up getting stalled and various things. And uh, so there was a uh, that was a bit of a an anxious period. And you know, it's important to remember that the. That the miners don't get um, don't get to choose. Excuse me, I think my alarm is going off here. Yeah, so it's important to understand that the miners don't actually get to decide um, what uh, what uh, updates go in the network. Um, but if the community as a whole has kind of more or less agreed that um, uh, that uh, you know we want a certain update to go through, and it was quite clear that um, there was. Uh, you know, negligible uh, opposition to Taproot. I don't actually know of any real serious arguments against it, um, but it, it is safest if you get all the miners on board um, first, because that reduces the chance of a chain split. If kind of like you have everybody's like, oh yeah, we want this this like update to go through. But if like, I don't know, 40% of the miners haven't updated their code correctly, um, they might accidentally create invalid blocks. And then, uh, you know, like, and again, that wouldn't be like a death knell for Bitcoin, but it would, it could cause some chaos. And so um, that's what was going on there. We kind of, we wanted to make sure that um, all the miners were kind of agreed with it and were ready. And uh, a big shout out to um, uh, Alejandro de la Torre. He, um, he was with Poolin at the time and he, um, uh, he, he did a lot of work kind of uh, contacting all the different miners and making sure they were communicating. Listen, we're on board this time because, uh, you know, four years ago, the um, uh, uh, several of the mining kind of groups were uh, uh, a bit of an obstacle to adding SegWits, but yeah. um, uh, but no, it seems to have gone through quite smoothly this time. And it's, uh, I think around, I think November 14th is the the estimated time when um, when Tappert should get activated. So you had this period in the spring where kind of everybody agreed and we kind of set to the actual block that the new rules would go live on. And that block uh, looks as though it's going to be added on November 14th, at which point the new rules um, for Tappert will be added. And at this point, you're probably jumping out of your chair wondering what Tappert is. Um, and so Taproot is is a, a few a few updates uh, together. Um, it, it involves adding a new address type, um, and uh, there it affects. Um, first of all, it introduces uh, a, a new type of digital signature, Schnorr signatures. Um, so up to up until um, up until Taproot, we've only been using ECDSA. Um, uh, crypt uh, cryptographic signatures, which have some limitations, whereas uh, Schnorr signatures have a variety of, um, like they work in a very, very similar fashion. 
Um, and the reason we didn't have them before in Bitcoin was because there was a, a patent that hadn't been expired yet. And so um, uh, that's why they weren't included in the original um, uh, Bitcoin implementation. But um, uh, that has long since expired. And um, and one thing that Schnorr signatures allow you to do is they allow you to aggregate um, signatures together. Um, this is technically possible in ECDSA, but it's a lot more efficient with Schnorr. Um, so if, let's say, um, uh, you and I each have a signature, if we want to do a multi-sig, um, so we both have produced our own signature um, to spend from an output, um, we can actually add the signatures together and put them into one signal signature that counts as both of ours together. Mm -hmm. And so um, this, uh, this makes multi-signature contracts much, much more efficient. So if you have... Um, uh, if you want to send to an output that requires several signatures together, you can instead create an address that can only be spent from from the aggregated signature everyone's together. Yeah. So it saves a lot of data space. It makes these multi-sig transactions potentially as cheap as ordinary um, signal signature transactions. The other thing it does is um, it uses this concept called MAST, which is a way of breaking down um, uh, Spending condi like some some contracts will have multiple spending conditions where you can either like this signature, um, these two signatures can um, uh, can claim these funds, or this signature and after a certain time amount of time has expired. And um, so you can send um, you can send funds to an output that can be spent in multiple different ways. This is uh, one of the um, this is used for Lightning Network transactions, for example, and a few other use cases. Um, and what Taproot allows you to do is when you're spending from that output, you only end up exposing the spending conditions that you use. So if you have, if you you could have, you could send to an output with with this um, uh, address, and encoded in that address is um, these various spending instructions. When you're spending from it, you don't need to show spending conditions A, B, and C if you're only using spending conditions B. Then you only reveal that amount and uh, that spending condition, and then this again saves a whole bunch of space and it, um, it improves privacy as well. Um, and so the end result is that you, um, uh, you know, stuff like Lightning Network opening and closing transactions will be much cheaper. Um, it's going to improve privacy um, along certain dimensions as well, because to an outside observer, it's not going to be clear whether something's a regular single spend transaction, whether it's a multi-sig transaction, whether it's a Lightning channel open or closure, that won't be as immediately off obvious in the majority of cases. So it's, it's better for privacy as well. That's awesome. That's excellent. Uh, thank you for explaining SegWit and, and Taproot. I, I kind of knew the basis of that. I knew the Schnorr signatures, uh, but yeah, it, it was helpful to me as, as well as my listeners. So I really appreciate that. Uh, so Mario, actually we're wrapping up. I know we're getting to the end of the time now. So I'll ask you some quick wrap up questions. And then at the end, I'll let sure. you open up with uh, anything that you want to talk about. So uh, it's been a pleasure having you on, but I guess what has been your biggest investing mistake or business mistake that you've made over your career? Um, trying to, trying to trade Bitcoin and time in the swings. I, um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've never lost Bitcoin through like, um, through like losing a key or anything like that. But anytime that I think I know what the price is going to do and try to bet on it, I don't trade kids. Just, just hold your coins and that's it. Um, and that's my, so that's my it. thing is too, is even if you're trying to trade, like, let's just say your cost basis, just to make it easy, was 10,000 and it goes up to 60,000. Even if it were to drop down to thirty thousand or forty thousand to buy in, in the event of selling, you're still realizing a thirty thousand dollar gain. You got to pay taxes on that, and then you have to then take that, pay the gain, and then you know buy back in and still realize a better price. And not saying I'm not faulting you. It's just it's it's very very tough to do. People like negate the yeah. taxes aspect of it a lot. Like you know, it's, it's yeah. crazy. If, if I, if I had all the coins that if, if, oh, if, if only I just, just held them and did nothing with them, that's, yeah, it, that was an easy, easy question. <laughs> that's good. Uh, I guess what's your favorite book, podcast, YouTube channel, or website that you like to go to for Bitcoin information? Oh man. Um, well, I, I, I'll give a shout out to the block size war by Jonathan Beer again. That might be for like, you know, that, that shouldn't be your first introduction to Bitcoin, but if you know a bit about Bitcoin and how it works and like, um, that's that's probably uh you know you don't have to be super technical but you, you should have the kind of the base understanding of bitcoin um but that's an excellent read um uh, jonathan beer does a fantastic job with that um and not only at telling the story of what happened he also it's he, he, it's very clear that he uh, kind of is himself more sympathetic to the small blocker arguments but he doesn't he goes out of his way to present the opposing arguments in a charitable light he also uh, writes the um the, the story in a way that 
teaches you about the ethos of the of the community and like you know each chapter you kind of learn a bit more about how the system works so it's not just a history it's it's also very educational so it's a fantastic piece of uh piece of work definitely read it um it's, it's i gotta in, shout out my own yeah it's, it's in my amazon cart for sure that that's uh for sure why it's in there yeah go ahead yeah um, uh, I mean, I got to shout out my own podcast. If I'm going to shout out a podcast, uh, sure, check definitely. us out. If you want the unhashed podcast, um, it's, uh, we're, we're R rated. It's a little, uh, rough and tumble and that it's, it's kind of like over here and a few dudes at a bar at midnight, um, also happen to be talking about Bitcoin. So don't listen to it if your kids are around. Um, but if you like kind of crass humor and then, uh, kind of, we swing between that and pretty, pretty good technical analysis. We got a, a fun crew over there and, you know, Ruben, uh, there's a lot of his own, uh, you know, research he talks about now and then. And uh, the other co is Brian and Colin Alds. They, they run their own business in space, um, uh, uh, privacypros.co. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've had my own experience in the companies I've talked to you guys about before. So we kind of all have different pieces to add, but uh, I think we're a good listen if, uh, uh, for, for the right niche audience. Awesome. Mario, thank you once again so much for your time. If someone wants to learn more about you, your business, where you work, your podcast, where would they go to find out more of that information? Sure. I'm um, pretty active on Twitter. Just look for Mario underscore Gibney. And uh, yeah, just head over to leden.io, L-E-D-N.io. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, consider us, uh, uh, check out the interest accounts. They're pretty easy to use. And if you don't like them, just withdraw a platform. And uh, yeah, if, if uh, I guess you probably mainly English speakers listen to this podcast, but if you, if you are Canadian, um, uh, we do we are running that uh, one Bitcoin giveaway contest. So if you uh, Join the platform, refer some friends, uh, you can win big. And for everyone else, you can still get that little bonus. But uh, uh, yeah, give us a look. Uh, you know, it's not for everyone, but uh, for some people, uh, we really uh, really do suit their needs. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. This has been fun. It's been a blast. All right, thanks everyone. As you know, you can always find us at theamateurinvestors.squarespace.com. Check us out on Spotify, YouTube, Twitter, uh, you name it. So have a good one, everyone. Talk to you later.